Welcome back. Welcome back. Wow, there's a lot of screaming. <laughs> Welcome back. Today I am going to share with you four things that people are getting wrong about survival gardening. As a garden writer, I see a lot of articles on gardening. And as a prepper, I see a lot of articles on prepping. And a lot of preppers are new gardeners. I figured out how to stockpile 55,000 pounds of beans underneath my bed. I made a contraption, you dig it down in there and I've got this bomb-proof shelter full of beans. But then I was thinking, what if I grew beans? So I, I looked up this method, right? And you can grow beans inside of a tube. Okay, right, cool, that's great. No, it's not. What you have to do is keep it simple and do things that work traditionally in your climate and that aren't gimmicky and weird. There's a lot of people that have really, really great info. There are people that are way more brilliant than me on food storage and on engineering cool systems of moving water around and solar cooking and baking outside and all that kind of stuff. I don't claim to be an expert on any of those things. But I am an expert on gardening. So I'm going to give you my two cents, my four things that people are missing when it comes to survival gardening. And number one is beds. They're all on sale right now. What? Do you see these beds? Do you think I purchased these beds, these beautiful beds? Where do you think I got these? Home Depot? Did I get these from the lumber yard? No, I didn't. Look at this. All I did was rough this area up, drag the soil over and make nice little mounded beds. And then I can run down with a hoe in between them and I don't have any wood to get in the edge. I don't have any boundaries on these beds. These are the native soil. Now obviously, this is November, so the summer okra is giving up. The summer sorrel is just coming in. But these beds continue through. These have had all kinds of things in them this year. They've had beans in them. They've had winter rye in them. They had turnips in the spring. Different things have been planted in these beds and harvested in these beds over the course of the year. And I did not go out and buy pressure treated lumber, or worse, buy cedar. I mean, not worse as a material, it's a great material, but who wants to spend a ton of money making raised beds? I don't like it. You can make raised beds simply by forking the ground up or tilling the ground up and then mounding up the beds. We get these big rainfall events here. So these beds being a little higher, that's good. They drain well, the soil warms up quickly in the spring, they are nice and loose and fluffy and good for the roots to move down in, and they cost me nothing to make. I can come out with a spade and a fork and make beds like this. I could use a broad fork, I could use a tiller, but the point is, simple in the ground. I get the benefits of a raised bed without having to actually go and build something expensive or gimmicky. I've seen these plastic interlocking bed things. Why would you do that? You don't need to do that. Just cut a hole in the ground and start doing it. Could you see the pioneers doing that? People that actually grew food to live? No, they didn't do that. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Let me show you something even simpler. Right here, I am standing in some single row gardens. Earlier this year, I put in a bunch of single row gardens. These are onions. They're just really starting to come back and be happy again because the weather's cooling out. Cooling off. This is really easy to take care of. I have rows that are a ways apart, and there's multiple benefits to this system, which you can learn in the video that I did on single row gardening. But I tilt this area up, I put my onions in rows, I put my cassavas in rows over here, I mounded them a little higher with some dirt, but single rows, 18 inches apart here. If I had less rain, I would go to three feet apart. The onions seem to be pretty happy at 18. But I can just work right in the ground here, just like our, our ancestors did. And it's super easy and it's highly productive. It allows you to take care of each individual plant nicely. They've got lots of breathing room. They don't need to be watered as much. They don't need as much fertilizing. 
as if they were tightly together in a small space. Wide, simple, single rows. It's old fashioned because it works. It works. And that's why I do it when I want food quickly and easily. And I highly recommend you watch the other video that I did on single row gardening because it may open your eyes to it. For a long time I rejected this system. It's like I like my tight systems and I like my polycultures. And then as I got more and more serious about growing more and more food for my family, I said, you know what, maybe they had a point, let's try it. They had a point. <laughs> and you can learn more about it. I'll post a link to the video. Avoid the complicated systems. The weird things where you have to buy special stuff, where you have to buy some packaged thing, where you have to get some plastic box, where you have to have aquaponics and you have to be an engineer and you have to balance all kinds of things. Don't worry about it. Do it like our ancestors did. Be simple. You can grow directly in the ground. Use the ground the Lord gave you. Play in the dirt. It's cool. The dirt is awesome. And if you take good care of it, it might even become soil. So that's number one. Number two is give your plant space to breathe. I told you 18 inches or 36 inches. These are 36 inches. This is our fall garden. I have beets and broccoli and I have radishes. These are icicle radishes and I've got other bits and pieces in these rows. This is an experiment where we decided to make a single row garden but because we had so much rain and I wanted lots of loose soil I mounded up the bed. So these now have the ground being tilled which was tilled down about six inches deep as deep as the tiller goes and then we mounded up another maybe eight inches on top of that which gives us a good bit of root development space. But if you look at it three feet apart. This area here is a long ways from the back of my house over there. And it's a long ways from over there on the side of the house where I have my hose. I don't want to drag a hose out here. I don't want to water. So what do I do? Space it wide. These are happy and growing and looking good on rainfall. It's been about a week since we had significant rain. They're still doing fine. If it goes another week or maybe a few more days, I might, I might have mercy. I'll send a kid out here with a watering can that has a weak nutrient solution in it like compost tea. And they'll come along here and soak these things. That's called fertigating. You're irrigating and fertilizing at the same time. I have these containers like five gallon containers and I'll mix up a little bit of either worm tea or a nutrient solution of whatever I have and then we'll take it down here we'll fill up the watering cans and then you just drench them soak them and walk down the rows and soak them and you don't have to use as much water because the nutrients in the water make the plants stronger and more able to deal with drought conditions I also just really don't have to feed them as much as I would if they were tight together. If these guys were tight together, they would be fighting for the limited resources in the ground. This is very poor soil. So I tilled in some alfalfa that we had. You could till in uh, kudzu if you had it. You know, you could till in manure if you had it. Just make sure it's not contaminated with some sort of horrible uh, herbicides. You could till in whatever you had available at the beginning, plant your crops, and then because they're spaced wider, because they're not fighting for the resources as much, you don't have to have super rich soil. And you can often just get by with foliar feeding them. You could have ground that is unamended, but you take a big 55 gallon drum and throw a bunch of weeds in it and let the weeds rot down, throw some urine in it, throw some chicken manure in it, something rich and nitrogenous, and then just use that to fertigate. If they have wide spacing, they just don't need the care and the water. If you've got two people sharing a gallon of water, it lasts. If you have 10 people sharing a gallon of water, it doesn't seem like so much water. If you have 50 people sharing a gallon of water, everybody gets a little shot. You barely get to wet your whistle and that's it. So that's what we're doing here. Wider spacing means less resources required to grow the plants. That's why things are spaced wide in old-fashioned gardens. 
So now the number two mistake I see people making with survival gardening is assuming that we have very high resources. We've got the hose, we've got tons of compost, we can go out and buy this and buy this and buy this and buy this. And they've never really seen plants grow in wide spacing. And how easily plants actually take care of themselves if they have the resources to do so. And they're not crowded up on top of each other where they need a lot of care a lot of food, a lot of water. The next mistake I see people making is growing crops that won't actually fill you up. Fortunately, I planted tons and tons and tons of hot peppers this year. So, in the event of a complete collapse of the supply lines, we'll still eat really, really well. No. This is not a great survival food. This is nice for medicine and for flavoring what you eat, but this is not the sort of thing that fills you up. Again, I was, I was reading this Prepper article and it said, this amazing system will allow you to grow food even in a grid down situation. And I'm like, oh, I wonder what it is. It was like this, this system where roots grow down through a bed of gravel or something, okay. That's cool. What are you growing in that? Lots and lots of roots, lots and lots of calories? No, you're growing salad. If you've ever been on a diet, have you tried filling up on salad? That's the number one complaint. You're gonna do a low fat diet, right? You're gonna do a low fat diet, you're gonna lose that extra 20 something pounds. So you pretty much starve yourself by eating plates of greens, like a rabbit. It's not filling. You can barely run on it. You are starving again after eating, what, lettuces? Cabbage is a little bit better. Uh, spinach, arugula, rocket, endive. Oh my goodness, I'm so full. No, you're not, you're hungry. That's a big, big problem. That's why you need to concentrate on calories. You are not a rabbit. You do not have the digestive system of a goat. You're a human being. You need something that's gonna fill you up. So if you don't have lots of animal products, like good fatty stuff, I mean, I hope you have like an avocado tree or something, that's great. But if you don't, you need to grow stuff that's gonna fill you up. So, you plant calorie crops. You plant stuff that when you cook it down and eat it, you can go back to work and you can keep running right on through. Concentrate on those root crops. Now I've tried to have, I've tried to do lots of beans, right? I love the idea of growing growing protein from beans. But we don't really have the right climate for it. So, our climate, it's roots. Oh shoot, there's the uh, ATF again. I'll never get my potatoes coppers. What you do is you plant calories, right? So, my favorite spring calories are potatoes. I love potatoes. I also am learning to like turnips. Turnips function both as a green and as a as a root crop. They will fill you up to an extent, but they're certainly better than endive. And sweet potatoes, I plant all varieties. I've got purple ones and orange ones red ones with white interiors and they make you full. So plant the stuff that makes you full. Roots are the best. If you're farther north, you might be looking at uh, flint corns. You might even have to start farming some small grains. Um, Jerusalem artichokes, I really liked the idea of, but the reality of them was less than ideal. I think they're a better food for animals than humans. You could fatten a pig on them though. So, I just, 
I just don't want you guys going, well, I have a garden. And then, you know, well, what are you growing? Well, I got lettuce. I got some peppers. Uh, I put in a couple of carrots. How long, how full are you gonna be? How full will you be? That's the question. Can you get full on it? This is pretty good here. That's some good calories. And I've got some other yams that are growing that are good calories. And I could eat french fries all through the apocalypse and feel quite satiated on that. So that's the third mistake. You're growing really, you're growing rabbit food. It's good to have that stuff. There may be some value in it, uh, particularly some things like kale. Nutritionally, it's good. But you gotta have something to fill your gut first. And that's why I recommend lots and lots of roots, lots and lots of calories first. The fourth and final mistake for today that I see people making is, is making things too complicated. You know, you don't need crazy expensive stuff. You don't need crazy expensive tools. You don't really need a tiller. You don't really need some sort of a, a weird cultivator thingy. You know, it's, it's, you can really get by with just a few simple tools. Now I know somebody's gonna say, well, I saw you use a tractor to till this area up. Sure, I'm not saying don't use it if you have it. You know, if you've got it, flaunt it. But you should know how to use the simple stuff too. Because something like this, how many parts are there that could break and not be replaceable? This is easy. If this part breaks, you could put a new handle on it. I have seen some pretty funny handles put back together down in the Caribbean. Wrap some tape around it, chop some pieces of wood and stick it back on there, okay? You don't need to wait for a shipment to come into port so you can get a new part so you can use your machete again. The same thing with the hose that I use. I like the old fashioned hoe heads. This is a good garden hoe. You can clean up a bed with this thing. This thing knows how to work. It's, it's one piece. It's one piece and you got a broom handle on it. In a pinch, you could cut a sapling and use that and put the hoe head on it. This is a, this is a fail safe tool. So you wanna make sure you have your fail safe, simple stuff, a spade, a fork, shovels, uh, a rake is nice for making seed beds, a couple of hoes, and of course a machete. I use a machete for just about everything. And in a, I mean, I can use it as a transplanter, I can use it to chop up compost, and I can use it for a lot of stuff. But with the, with composting, you know, as my wife and I were talking about, she says, you know, people, just like you write in your book, people look at composting and then they say, oh, the carbon to nitrogen ratio has got to be like this and you've got to turn it this many times and you've got to do this and that and the other thing. And uh, what's the, the giant, Johnson Sioux bioreactor, somebody sent me a link to the other day and I said, and I looked it all up and I read about it and I went, that's too complicated. I'm not going to ever build that thing. But I tell you, I could stack a bunch of stuff in a pile and let it rot down. Simple, simple, simple. Do the stuff that you're actually going to do. Don't go for some incredible, complicated, ideal system that you imagine. Do what you're going to do. If you can go out and dig a four foot by four foot in an afternoon and plant some grocery store potatoes in it, do that. Don't wait until you have perfect seed and your husband can build this thing and you can go buy this thing and you can get this perfect tool and one day we're probably gonna start gardening because I saw all these videos on it and I've been learning about it for years. Do what you can and, and stick to the simple stuff, the stuff that doesn't break down easily, the stuff that is like tried and true technology that will never ever fail you. And don't get caught up in trying to make complicated systems or perfect systems. This is not a perfect world. There are no perfect people. There is no ideal system. There are all kinds of different systems that may work better for you. You might find that closer spacing is better or wider spacing is better. But the simplicity of seeds, water, soil, sunshine, simple tools, and sweat 
you get stuff done. And that's where you're going to have really good success. It's a learning curve. Don't make it really hard on yourself right from the beginning by trying to build some complicated system that you saw somebody else do. Don't worry about it, keep it simple. Those are four survival gardening mistakes that I see people making regularly and I don't want you to make them too. I'll put some links below this video. I've got a list of some of my favorite tools and I've got a book called Grow or Die, The Good Guide to Survival Gardening, which crazy, sold out. It absolutely sold out during the pandemic last year. It was, it was nuts, like it was gone for weeks. So if you want a copy of that, um, get it now, because <laughs> you never know. Um, it's probably not as useful as a machete, but who knows, it might be. Um, I, a lot of people have written me and said they really appreciated it. You can, you can do things. You can grow your own food. You don't have to worry. Putting food in the ground is an insurance policy, and you'll feel good about it, along with whatever you're stockpiling and doing. I was watching Lead Farmer 73 uh, yesterday, and he was talking about preparedness, and I thought, yep, this is the time. We've gotta be on top of things. And really, every point in history has been a good time to be prepared and to have food for your family. And even if there is no crisis and things don't get particularly bad, you have food in the ground. And the quality of the food that you can grow in your backyard is better than anything you can buy. It's right from your backyard. You know what went into it, you know where it's coming from, and it's not being shipped across the entire country. So there's so many wonderful things about growing your own food, and I recommend you do that, even if you aren't worried. Anyhow, thanks for joining me. Catch you all next time. Be sure to check out the links below. And if you want to get the new My Root Exudate Milkshake Brings All the Soil Life to the Yard shirt, I'll put a link to that too. Love Cat, who comments regularly on this channel, came up with this, that My Root Exudate Milkshake Brings All the Soil Life to the Yard. So obviously it had to be a t-shirt, illustrated by our own Tom Sensible. So thank you for that. Catch you all next time, and until then, may your thumbs always be green. Come check out this soil. It's taken me all day to do. Hi, hon. Wow, this soil is so rich. I know, it's trying to be like me. Oh my word. Is this a water apple tree? Yeah, it's gonna go great in the soil. Wow, it's really gonna take off here. What's in the soil anyways? It's best you keep your business to yourself. All right, I don't need no answers. Do you throw banana peels in the trash? Are your coffee grounds also being thrown in the trash? Do you compost ham? <laughs> Are you sick and tired of all the rules about composting? Do you wish you could compost in a super easy way? And stop throwing things in a landfill? And stop being a terrible person? Click on the link below and sign up and get my new composting booklet, which shows you how to compost easily and simply with hardly any, any work at all. It's insane how easy it is because it follows natural principles. Sign up now. Quantities are not limited.